Hi, everybody. Um, this is uh, Tucker Balch at Lucenta Research. I'm here also with our uh, CEO, Ares Katz. Uh, Ares, why don't you kick us off? Sure. Uh, thank you, Tucker. Um, it's so nice to see that we've maxed the capacity of uh, the attendees for this webinar. The folks who are not able to join, unfortunately, will have to wait for the recording of this webinar that will be displayed and available on our website uh, within a day or so. So uh, I apologize in advance for not realizing we'll have such a huge uh, uh, demand, which is very flattering, obviously, and we thank the ones that have joined us today. Um, as you know, uh, Lucena has been uh, uh, developing and uh, promoting quantitative analysis technology and decision support technology for investment professionals. In the last year, we have uh, developed uh, several uh, technologies and quantitative uh, analysis tools that allows uh, non-quants, folks who make decisions on investment, discretionary investment in their portfolio or the client's portfolio, to utilize quantitative analysis technology um, at their discretion using our technology and using our services. Um, I'm uh, very excited to present today some of the best strategies that we have uh, been able to uh, come up with through our own research over the course of the last year. Um, you'll see today some information that is not normally previewed by uh, the wide audience. These are a type of uh, you know techniques and strategies that are normally kept behind closed doors and uh, our goal today is to somehow uh, you know expose some of the decisions and the technologies that are being advanced through our technology and our capabilities to empower users um, with this type of uh, uh, technique and technology. Anyway, um, I'm going to um, pass on the podium to Tucker who's going to go over the agenda for today's webinar and we will play um, you know both roles as we present some of those techniques that I mentioned before. Tucker, take it away. Sure. Um, thanks, Eris. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Tucker Balch. Uh, I'm CTO of Lucena Research. Um, I'm also a professor at uh, Georgia Tech and uh, Lucena benefits uh, greatly from our uh, association with Georgia Tech and to including the talent of folks that have uh, have joined us. Um, let me quickly um, provide an overview of uh, what Lucena offers. Um, our flagship product is uh, called QuantDesk and it delivers a lot of what I'm going to show you today uh, in a cloud-based uh, mechanism uh, to your desktop. So if you're interested in adding a quantitative edge to your investing approach, uh, QuantDesk is, a, is an easy way to enter that. We also provide quant for hire services. Uh, we've got a staff of very strong quantitative analysts and we work with our clients to build custom strategies and help them improve their investing process. And uh, finally, we are just now beginning to roll out a proprietary uh, validated model strategies. And we're gonna show you some of those uh, today. And, and this reflects uh, some of what we've discovered really over the last two years uh, in terms of machine learning and AI techniques um, and just general uh, principles of the market. And we're real excited to show you how some of these, how some of these things work. Uh, a few disclaimers. Um, we're not an investment advisor and we don't provide uh, investing advice. Um, do not assume that the methods we're going to show you um, will be profitable. They're based on historical studies and hypothetical studies. And uh, as you know, uh, past performance uh, is not necessarily predictive of future performance. Now, let me give you a little preview of what we're going to talk about. We're going to focus on uh, four uh, strategies that we've been uh, looking at and, and developing recently. Um, the, uh, the first two, Iron Grail and Calm C, leverage uh, machine learning techniques uh, to forecast either prices or volatility. Uh, Hive is an idea where we have multiple 
event-based strategies that are all running in parallel. Uh, Hive is for a bit more active trading. And uh, one that we're very, very excited about that we're um, uh, just beginning to uh, fully explore and backtest is a pairs trading approach. And this is our first uh, strongly performing uh, market neutral approach. Um, and I'll explain what that means uh, in a little bit. So let me get started now with uh, uh, Iron Grail. So Iron Grail is a forecasting approach where we uh, look at historical price patterns in order to make a forecast in the future. Now, before I dive uh, too deeply into Iron Grail, I want to show you uh, on our QuantDesk platform how forecasting uh, approaches are presented. Let me call that up real quick. Errors, I just want to check with you that uh, QuantDesk is visible there. Yes, looking good. Thanks, okay. Doctor. All right. Um, so this is uh, this is what uh, uh, QuantDesk looks like. Um, it's a cloud-based uh, cloud-based system. All of the heavy lifting and number crunching uh, happens on our servers. Uh, our important uh, features are identified by tabs along the top here. We're looking here at the forecast forecast feature and here we've selected our dow portfolio so over here we've got the equities in the dow and they're presented um, both in a uh, tabular format and a graphical format and this is the same for for all of our uh, major features now the way uh, forecasting works is uh, first you select a model and we'll go with the default model uh, but keep in mind that uh, uh, Iron Grail is going to be available as a uh, proprietary model uh, on our platform. Uh, it's not deployed yet, but it will be soon. Uh, then for the particular model, you select how far into the future you want to forecast. In this case, we're selecting two weeks. Um, and how much data you want to use historically to make that forecast. Then you click the forecast button and QuantDesk goes to work. Now let's look... Uh, say in detail at the forecast for Boeing. We click on Boeing there and we can see that uh, uh, graphically, this is how it's been performing recently. And this is the way we portray the forecast. Um, the middle line is the forecast price and then the upper and lower lines are confidence bounds. Now we, we report our confidence in two ways. One is with stars, uh, yellow stars that reflect essentially how uh, uh, for the cases that we matched in history, um, how much the same or different they are. If they're very similar, then uh, we have a high confidence. If they're very much different, we have a lower confidence. So five stars is the best and one star is, is the least best. We've also got something called a uh, backtest score. Oh, and one thing to report here is uh, it's not predicting much change in the price of uh, Boeing uh, over the next uh, two weeks. For some of these other equities, uh, there's, a, there's a larger forecast change. For instance, a quarter of a percent here for GE uh, and, and, and so on. There's one other aspect to the uh, confidence that we report. We call it a backtest score. And what we do there is we, we go back to the beginning of the uh, time frame and we make a two-week forecast every day and we see how we did. And that information is reflected in this table uh, and we've got a statistical-based approach to scoring that performance. In this case, uh, the backtest um, score is very high, uh, meaning that our system has had, a, has had a good track record with Boeing. Okay, so that, that's just to give you a feel for how forecasts are represented on uh, QuantDesk. That's better. Okay, good. That's more. Um, okay. Uh, so Iron Grail uses pattern matching, and uh, it's uh, so far our most effective method for making uh, forecasts uh, far into the future. And by far, I mean uh, as far as one month. And the strategy I'm, the strategy I'm going to show you, we've looked both at making one-month forecasts and uh, one-week forecasts. Now, how do we do it? Um, the first thing we do is we 
uh, for a particular stock, we look at its pattern over the last 63 days. So this, uh, this uh, vertical blue line here represents today, and we go back 63 days uh, to look at its price each day. And uh, for the mathematically inclined, we, we normalize it to one uh, as of today. Now, um, of course, we want to forecast the future, so we have to look at some data that's going to help us do that, and this is the data that we use. Uh, this is an example of one data element uh, in our database that we, that we look at. Now, imagine this is, say, an index card in which we've written down the historical performance of a stock, and we Let's say we went back one month, and suppose this is, say, IBM. So we imagine that uh, this vertical line represents a day at which we're trying to make a forecast. And we go back and look at the 63 days of performance before that. But because we're uh, looking back in history, we also know what happened the 21 days after that. Uh, now, at this point in time, a month ago, we had information for all 500 stocks in the S&P 500, so we essentially create 500 of these index cards. Uh, and then we go back another day in time, and we repeat that process, and eventually we have thousands of index cards that represent a historical performance of the stock before this vertical line and future performance. Now, here's how we build our forecast, is we look at the pattern, the current pattern for the stock that we're trying to predict, and we search among all those thousands of index cards for the 10 best matches to this pattern. And then we look at, okay, and so we're matching this part of the pattern. Then we say, look, we know what happened in the future, and we, of those 10 best matches, we blend the result to make our forecast. So that's how we make our forecasts. And uh, here's what we do with the forecasts um, in, in this particular strategy. It's, this is a long only strategy, and I'm gonna show you monthly rebalancing. But what we do is at the beginning of each month, we make a forecast for all the S&P 500 stocks, and we simulate investing in the top 50 stocks. And we do that once each month. Now here's a simulation of that approach uh, going back five years. The uh, purple line is the performance of the S&P 500, and the green line is the performance of this strategy in our, in our back tester or market simulator. Um, as you can see here, uh, we've, we saw a return over that period of 156%, um, and here you can see the volatility. Overall, the sharp ratio for this approach over the five years is uh, 0.66, which uh, is not too bad when you consider the, uh, the drawdowns in uh, 2008 and 2009. Um, and as you can see, the, the approach outperforms uh, S&P 500 uh, each year except uh, 2011. Now, keep in mind, this is a long approach so it is subject to uh, drawdowns in the market, um, but uh, still, it, still it outperforms the market overall. Now, one thing that's interesting about this approach that I want to point out is it's, it's based on price history only. And of course, there's many other factors that, that affect what happens to the price of a stock. And uh, in general, approaches that are technical-based or you know, based on price uh, generally have less effectiveness over longer periods of time, but if you turn that around, they potentially become more effective over shorter periods of time. So, uh, for example, if we trade this approach weekly instead of monthly, we get uh, uh, even stronger performance in terms of return, 305%. Uh, but we also have much higher volatility uh, and uh, still a slightly higher sharp ratio than, than, than the other approach. Now, a couple things I want to point out here 
is uh, this is um, this is out of sample in the sense that uh, when we run our simulation, we roll back time and we only allow the system to view data uh, before the particular date where it's simulating a trade. We also uh, account for commissions and slippage. So this is a, a $100 million portfolio, uh, but we, uh, we expect over $58 million uh, in slippage, meaning we assume the market's going to go against us when we, uh, uh, when we make a particular trade. So that's, uh, that's Iron Grail. Let me move to the next approach. Next approach is Calm C. Uh, this is um, this is inspired somewhat by low volatility ETFs. You might be familiar with the ETF called SPLV. It's a it's a it's an ETF that works in the following way. Each uh, I believe it's monthly. It could be quarterly, but they they look at the they measure the historic volatility of all 500 stocks in the S&P 500. They then find the 100 lowest volatility stocks without regard to the return, just volatility, and they invest uniformly in those 100 lowest volatility stocks. Now, SPLV has been performing uh, very nicely over the last few years. Also, um, USMV, which is another uh, low volatility approach. I believe it's uh, by uh, Barra. Anyways, uh, both of those ETFs have been doing well, but they use historic volatility. And we were thinking, since we're a machine learning forecasting house, uh, why don't we try to use forecast volatility instead of look back volatility and see if we can perform better. And that's uh, that's what inspires uh, Calm C. Uh, here's the way it works is uh, each month we forecast volatility for all equities in a group. And, and we've tried this across uh, several groups. Uh, then we purchase the uh, lowest uh, volatility, either 25% or 50% of the group. So here are some example back tests using that method. Um, again, green is the performance of our fund and purple is the uh, benchmark. This is an application to the NASDAQ 100, uh, five years. And as you can see, uh, in, in some years, excuse me, had a little glitch. Errors, are we seeing the correct screen? Sorry about that. No, uh, just change it to the other. OK. Uh, anyways, in, in some years, the um, cumulative return is not quite as high as the benchmark. But the volatility, in all cases, is about half. So we've got a daily volatility of 0.86% of compared to the NASDAQ 100. That's 1.5% uh, uh, each day. Um, so a higher Sharpe ratio, almost double the Sharpe ratio of the NASDAQ 100, but uh, still we capture uh, all the return with half the volatility. So that's an application to the uh, NASDAQ 100. It, uh, it works also for um, uh, S&P 500. So this is looking back five years at the S&P 500. Uh, in this case, total performance is actually, uh, cumulative performance is actually higher than S&P 500. And uh, the uh, benchmark, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, volatility is again half S&P 500. So this is a very um, uh, really nice way of um, capturing most of the return of a particular index, but uh, in a much lower volatility approach. Uh, this is going back uh, eight years for the S&P 500 still strong uh, performance in, 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 that, in that case. Uh, now, one thing I want to go back um, uh, real quick uh, to show you an aspect of uh, QuantDesk that relates to this. We use um, 
in all of these example portfolios, uh, an optimizer, which is a method for looking at uh, the components of a portfolio and deciding how much to uh, how much to allocate to each one. And the optimizer can have a couple different goals. Uh, one of which is to minimize risk. Uh, there is also a blended approach where you um, uh, seek to uh, maximize sharp ratio. But what the optimizer does is it it looks at the equities you're holding and then looks at a potential, you know, many thousands of potential different allocations uh, to find one that uh, one that's better. So in this case, we um, were aiming to maximize sharp. And as you can see over this look back period, where the orange is the optimized portfolio, we have we reduce volatility uh, significantly, and therefore uh, increase our sharp ratio. Uh, looking forward, you see forecast volatility for the original portfolio in blue and for the optimized portfolio in orange. Um, now this is look back, it's optimizing over this look back period, but in the back test that we've shown you, we enter the positions as of the current date and then carry those forward. So we're not, uh, we're, we're not cheating in any way when we back test, we, we enter the positions uh, using only previous information. Uh, the optimizer provides you the new allocations and you can sort by weights. You can see, for instance, in this case, it uh, is looking for 10% in Microsoft, whereas our earlier allocation was, uh, was 4% in Microsoft. And in some of the equities, it's actually chosen uh, uh, not to hold them. Uh, so that's the optimizer that's, a, that's part of a lot of the uh, approaches I've been showing you. Okay. The uh, next approach is uh, something we call Hive, which is based on event-based strategies. And uh, Ares is going to uh, going to take over here and, and tell you about how that approach works. Ares, I can uh, still run the slides if you like. Oh, you know what? Uh, do you want to take the slides over? Let me know. Taco, why don't you give me control and I'll just show the same slides on my screen. Okay. It'll be easier. Sure, will do. <clears throat> Let me share my screen. Okay. You should have control now. Can you see my screen uh, okay, Tucker? Let me check. I haven't shown it yet. So not Don't yet. see it yet. Now I see it. Okay, good. Okay, so um, by the way, if any of you have has any questions, uh, please uh, submit those through the panel, the go to webinar panel. We'll address those at the end of the presentation. So let's discuss Hive and maybe more specifically the event-based investment approach. So if you think about events, and we've had several seminars or webinars that discuss the event analyzer, uh, the idea behind event analysis is to identify predictive behavior that is uh, derived from conditions that historically had led to consistent behavior of certain equity regime or market regime. So think about very simple approach if you see a price fluctuation in combination with volume increase, potentially that could be in a very simple uh, manner, a momentum to the upside and normally you would see stocks start to move up if the market conditions obviously support that. But you can actually have a lot more complex events and I'm going to show you two events that we have come across through our event studies. We share those events and we actually publish those events to our customers front end, the, the, uh, the Quandesk um, um, product, 
by which they can imme immediately enjoy the benefits of our research by identifying entry and exit positions to equities that match the event criteria. Uh, I'm going to shift quickly just to show you mechanically how it works on Quandesk and then we'll discuss these two specific events um, and go into more details. So just bear with me, I'm going to try and bring Quandesk here on the screen and see how it goes. One second. Okay, so um, what you see here on Quandesk is the event scan screen. Uh, this is real life, by the way. This is happening now as we speak. And what I'm doing now is I'm providing a scan that goes through all my events that I have on my system to identify which ones were triggered today. And you can see that the top one, which we will cover very shortly, describes as Bollinger, bottom, green, black, bullish. And there are two equities that have been identified earlier today as potential buying opportunities. Just to check uh, whether this is a really true valuable event, you can see that there is a very positive change to those two equities uh, and they were identified earlier today and you can see that um, actually it turned out to be a good forecast on, on that behavior. What you see below that is the event study graph and we've talked about it at length in previous uh, webinars, but essentially what it shows you is as the, the, the zero line here represents the day of the event um, and the line below or, or before the zero line to the left of the zero line shows the behavior of the equity uh, universe that you are evaluating in the study before the event date. And you can see there's a down momentum, there's a big jump, all of a sudden a mean reversion, some call it. And then you'll see basically the whole behavior looking forward past the event date, five to 20 days thereafter. Um, the event study was conducted on a year in the past or a period of time in the past. And then, of course, as Tucker mentioned, we test through a back testing approach a period that is completely out of sample. That's not the year that was defining the event to see if the behavior really uh, consistently uh, persist into the future. So um, this is kind of the mechanics of how we submit these events to the user's um, platform and then they can see the events themselves. They can create additional events if they want to and uh, benefit from uh, the results of these events. These are just other events that we have that are more sector specific. You can see uh, a gap up event that has other, other securities that had come up uh, earlier today. This is real, real time. So anyway, let me go back to the presentation and I'll talk more about these specific events and how we conduct the research and how we can apply those to a, a successful trading strategy. So let me move quickly back to our presentation. So there's really two types of events that I'd like to um, concentrate on today, the Bollinger Bottom and, uh, and the Gap Up events. And there are obviously many others. Um, to, everybody knows about John Bollinger in the early 80s. Uh, you know, he developed uh, the relative adaptive high and low indicators that basically provide you some sort of an insight based on price movement uh, if you are at the high end or the low end of your uh, value power, of course, relative to your historical moving averages. Without getting too much detail, uh, the short story is that you have three bands. The top bands and the bottom bands are the ones that you want to look at from uh, overbought. If you cross the top band, you're in overbought condition. If you cross the lower band, you are in oversold condition, which basically indicates a mean reversion. Um, what we have done is we've taken an approach by which we identify uh, more than just the Bollinger indicator on its own core, but we've identified additional market as well as indicators that relate to uh, momentum, strength. Uh, we combine those from a uh, strength perspective with some fundamental information. We use uh, Joel Greenblatt uh, from Great Neck, New York, who in the 50s developed uh, a very interesting approach to, um, to uh, um, how, to, how, how can you create a strong 
identification from fundamental perspective of uh, companies in the Russell 1000. But in essence, we combine all these things together, and then we go through a simulation through our back tester, and you can see here that it performed extremely well over the course of the last uh, five and a half, almost six years. Um, again, the, the purple uh, line uh, represents the benchmark, which is the S&P 500. And essentially what we've done here is we've identified through the course of these five and a half years, every condition against uh, the S&P 500 that indicated a buying opportunity based on crossing the lower band of, uh, of the Greenblatt uh, indicator, but also crossing it to the upside. Essentially there's two crosses. You can cross towards the bottom, then cross back towards the top. We identify these conditions where it crosses back towards the top with other strong indicators that are more market and individual momentum indicators. And you can see that the results have been uh, uh, fairly interesting over the last uh, um, five and a half, uh, almost six years. The gap up indicator is another interesting approach to identify, again, technical momentum. Uh, but again, we combine technical indicators with some fundamental indicators to really create a compilation of multiple indicators that are that are most relevant to create a, a movement uh, that is in a way predictive. And again, you want to look at more than just the equities themselves. You want to see how they relate to the market itself. Are you in a bull market or in a bear market or a flat market condition? And then you can uh, really apply some of those indicators uh, you know, more effectively to go along with the market. So you can see here that we've done uh, the following uh, indicators. A gap up approach, which means at the open, the stock is uh, either higher or lower than the previous close because you have a gap that can be positive or negative. Gap up obviously indicates a positive change in the value from the previous close. There's a volume change. These are low beta stocks, which means they behave very similarly uh, or, or very highly correlated to the market itself. And of course, uh, uh, low market volatility and, and strong stocks with high sharp ratio. And again, if you look at the um, back test results, it is interesting. First of all, it's performing very well, as you can see, and it totally avoided the down, uh, the downside of 2008 and 2009, this big drawdown here. See, it's pretty much flat, which means the strategy is smart enough to identify these big downtrends early enough in the game and completely stay out of the market. You can see it's done here. It's done the same thing here in 2010, 2011 as well. So it was very smart to identify down uh, market conditions and stay out of the market and then take advantage of the uh, swings to the upside. And that's really what's nice about uh, this uh, gap up strategy. Now shift to the other screen. Now you're in. OK. Uh, yeah, sorry for this. Um, uh, go to webinars has a couple bugs today. Um, uh, anyways, we um, uh, we of course like to draw on the latest approaches. There's this nice book, uh, Pairs Trading, that we uh, took a look at and found a lot of value in. Um, but we always carry things a little bit further in internally. Uh, we've got some uh, highly skilled uh, quants and developers, and uh, we we implemented this approach that I'll tell you about that that, that works very nicely. But uh, we're also uh, able to take it a little bit further and real excited about about that as well. But let me let me tell you about the, the basics of pairs trading. So a um, first important step is you have to first find pairs of stocks that exhibit the behavior that can potentially be profitable. And as I mentioned before, th those are pairs of stocks that tend to move together and they occasionally diverge apart, uh, but then they drift back towards each other. So you need to have both of those properties for, uh, for a good pair. Once you've identified pairs that you might look at, you then need to monitor them and look for divergence events. So as an example, the approach I'm going to show you, we look at uh, all potential pairs between 
all stocks in the S&P 500. So that's, uh, you know, approximately 500 squared, which is a large number. Uh, and then we monitor all those. Um, well, we first find pairs that are potentially useful, and then we monitor them every day to find uh, divergence events. So let me show you what that looks like. Uh, here's an example that um, an example pair that our system discovered, and it's uh, Cisco and APD. And uh, in this case, Cisco is the red line, and APD is the blue line. And as you can see uh, in this example, they do tend to move together. Uh, sometimes they spread apart, but then they come back, come back together. So our system identified these two pairs in, in this uh, up market. And on this date, which is uh, February 27, so we, uh, we focused uh, on the year 2009, uh, the system noted that they diverged and it entered the pairs trade. Now the pairs trade always involves uh, going long one stock and shorting the other stock. Uh, so in this case, uh, Cisco uh, is, it, it didn't go up, but relative to APD, it went up. Uh, APD went down. So in this case, the system is anticipating that APD is going to go back up and Cisco is going to go down. So we short Cisco and buy APD um, on February 27. Now, as you can see, over several days, they converged back together. And at that point, we exit the trade. Now, note that um, uh, this was a upward trending market, uh, and we, we made money. Now, it turns out, yes, because we shorted Cisco, we lost a little bit, but that was offset uh, by, the, by the gain with um, APD. Um, there was another uh, trading opportunity when they diverged on March 20. Uh, and in this case, it was uh, inverted. We, uh, Cisco had diverged down while APD had diverged up. So we shorted APD and bought Cisco. Uh, and then as they converged, um, we, we, made, we made the return. Now, the reason uh, the long and short uh, is important is because that provides you immunity to the direction of the market. So as long as they tend to trend back together, uh, you can make money whether the market goes up or it goes down. So let me show you an example uh, in a downward market. This is with that uh, same pair of stocks. Again, they diverged on uh, February uh, 13th, uh, and we, in this case, shorted APD and uh, went long on uh, Cisco, uh, and then they converged several days later. And this is showing the uh, uh, percentage return on that pair over that time period. So as you can see, um, uh, you can make money in a downward market and an upward market and because you're balanced long and short, you're uh, immune to major down moves in the market. Uh, of course, um, uh, you also don't make uh, as much money in a, in a strong or upward moving market. But overall, it's a substantially lower risk uh, kind of approach. Um, here's a little bit of uh, detail, uh, a little bit of the underlying uh, mathematics of what we do. And again, this is... Uh, uh, based on, on, on the book we showed you. Um, what we do is uh, we look at uh, each potential pair of stocks and we perform this, uh, this analysis for them. Uh, so the, the horizontal axis represents for each day the price of one of the stocks and the vertical axis represents the price of the other stock. So this particular point here represents um, the uh, one particular day and the price of the of the two stocks. Now you can see that they, on any particular day, they tend to follow this trend line, and we we do a linear regression to find this uh, trend line, and uh, that that is essentially a model of the relationship uh, between the stocks. Now if we look at over time, imagine let me go back one moment. 
Um, the what what happens over time is if there's a large divergence, it's essentially would be represented by one of these dots being away from that uh, line, but we assume that it always uh, drifts back. Now, if we plot that relationship over time, this is what you see. So this middle line represents uh, essentially um, that they're they're exactly um, moving in sync, and a big divergence up here uh, represents that they've moved away from that from that model. So uh, what we um, what we do is we look for those big divergences as trading opportunities. Um, and then we look for it to come back to zero as, a, as an exit. Uh, so one thing to mention is the way that we score the potential pairs is we, we look for those pairs that uh, are highly correlated, um, but also have uh, some, somewhat of a, of a standard deviation because those standard deviations um, provide trading opportunities. Okay, so that's how we find the pairs and how we look for the trading opportunities. So these back here are the specific trading opportunities in 2009 for Cisco and APD. Um, so when we exceed essentially one standard deviation, uh, that's a signal to entry. And when we cross back through the zero line, that's an exit. Here is another trade entry and an exit. Um, another trade entry and an exit. Um, now, in terms of uh, how that works over time, here's our back test through 2009. Uh, the important thing to note is uh, it was essentially immune to this strong drawdown. Uh, it, in this initial part of the drawdown, it didn't make money, but it didn't lose money either, and that's the uh, that's the key value of a uh, market neutral approach. Uh, but it continued to, to make money throughout the rest of the year, uh, essentially gaining 30% while the uh, benchmark uh, S&P 500 uh, made 21% over that period. It's got a uh, much lower standard deviation than the market, so lower volatility, uh, 0.73 versus uh, 1.7, uh, and a higher sharp ratio during this period, sharp ratio of uh, of uh, two compared to market of uh, 0.86. Now, as I mentioned before, um, uh, we also like to innovate uh, in-house. And uh, after uh, develop after implementing this method, which of course we're very pleased with, uh, we um, uh, devised a, a, a modification to this approach that enables us to find even even better pairs. Um, uh, I, I can't give you details of, of, of that approach because it's proprietary, but by uh, employing this method over the same period, you can see that we uh, have even a higher performance, uh, significantly higher. Um, and this is primarily based on an, an approach for discovering the pairs uh, in a slightly more innovative way. We call this approach uh, Hermes. Okay, let's um, pause for a moment now and uh, take a look at uh, any questions folks might have. We're pleased to hear from you. Um, Ares, you want to take a stab at them, or you want me to take a stab? Okay, we have a yeah, sure. We have quite a few. I'm gonna uh, obviously divert to you if uh, anything gets too technical, but I'm going to go through some of the questions. We have quite a few, obviously. We'll try and get to all of them the best we can, but just uh, to give you some one more point of logistics, uh, we're going to publish this webinar online, so it'll be downloadable and viewable at your leisure. In addition, there is a weekly email that I send out that basically describes some of these strategies on a real portfolio that we simulate trading before market opens every week, and we basically conclude how we've done uh, at the end of the week. So that's pretty much a live traded type of portfolio, although it's a sample educational exercise. It's a really nice way to understand the dynamics of our technology, and that's available on our website. 
uh, if you go to the uh, main website on the top, you'll see a link to subscribe to that newsletter. Let's get to the questions. So the first question is, uh, can this tool be used outside the United States and how? Um, so we currently support, um, from data perspective, U.S. Uh, securities and equities uh, um, only. We don't uh, support derivatives. We don't support um, futures or um, other exchanges beyond the United States. Uh, however, we are going to expand to the European and Asia Pacific markets in the near future. So just stay tuned. Uh, more announcements are to come soon. But for now, our technology and our data, our technology is supportive of any data as long as we have the proper source of the data. Uh, but we currently only provide support for U.S. Um, equities, U.S. Um, ETFs, mutual funds, and ADRs. Um, next question uh, is, uh, maybe for you, Tucker, is how are you projecting volatility for COMC? Sure. Um, actually, a couple of people asked a question relating to that. Um, we use a K-nearest neighbor machine learning algorithm um, to forecast volatility. Uh, the, the selection of factors that we use to make that prediction is, is uh, proprietary, though. But uh, we, we find that it actually, lots of folks are probably familiar with GARCH, uh, which is a linear regression-based approach. Um, we, we find that uh, our, our approach uh, provides a more accurate prediction of volatility than, than GARCH does. Thanks, Tucker. Um, another interesting question is um, from someone who is asking about if we can provide some sort of a data feed into another application or another system. And the answer is yes. We've had the several customers requesting similar type of deliveries. Um, we can provide what we call an alpha vector stream that can derive uh, a daily, um, I guess, ranked uh, delivery of uh, equity uh, basket uh, to a designated area. Uh, we do it uh, for several customers, and we can talk about that. If anybody's interested, you know, just reach out to me, and uh, I'll direct you to the right resource within our company to explore it further. Um, Another question, is your software advisory only, or is it possible to use it for auto trading? Tucker, you want to take that? Uh, sure. So we, we, we presently uh, provide alerts. For instance, uh, if you uh, discover uh, event-based approaches and you want to be alerted for those opportunities, we push alerts to the Quant Desk platform and also by email. We don't presently provide auto execution, but that is uh, certainly on our agenda for the uh, for the next year. We're very interested uh, to move in that direction, but that's not presently supported. Okay, thanks, Tucker. Um, another question is, how would you uh, how do you define the benchmark for this strategy? I assume it's the uh, it's the pairs trading strategy. Um, the question is uh, the assumption is that the two stocks in some ratio or weights. Um, yeah, so market neutral strategies uh, are in general uh, difficult to find benchmarks for. Uh, there are. Market, there is a market neutral hedge fund strategy, uh, market neutral hedge fund index that uh, could be used as a benchmark for the pairs trading approach. But most uh, market neutral fund managers will tell you that their benchmark is zero, uh, meaning that uh, they're looking for absolute return uh, with, without regard to any particular market index. Okay. Um so uh, another question, I can probably take that, Tucker. Uh, have you done any longer term backtest on the pairs strategy approach? And the answer is yes. So as you saw, the results are fairly compelling from what Tucker had, uh, had uh, presented on the screen. Um, you know, when we see these type of strong results, we usually become very suspicious and we start to see if there's anything that, uh, any bug or any error in our assumptions or in our technologies. 
Um, so we've gone back as long as uh, 15 years, or I think actually from 2000, and uh, the results have been very, fairly consistent uh, during uh, bull and bear markets. Uh, and we are continuing to evaluate uh, ways to take any type of, uh, I guess, suspicious out of the equation. So yes, the answer is yes, we've done longer term back testing all the way down back to uh, 2000. Next question. <clears throat> Um, were all the pairs developed on QuantDesk on the QuantDesk platform? So <clears throat> um, the answer is a no. Uh, the the pairs were developed by Quants. Really, uh, they are conducting ongoing research, and obviously that's one of the strategies that we develop as a, as part of our Quants. That's not part of QuantDesk yet. However, we are adding a new module into QuantDesk that would allow you to define the means by which you can discover pairs and then of course uh, backtest strategies using these pairs and create what we call an event study or event uh, trigger that when the pairs provide an entry alert you'll get very much the same as you have currently with our other events uh, a trigger alert either on the screen or through an email that will be sent to you. So expect uh, announcements with regards to pairs trading on QuantDesk platform sometimes in the near future as well. <clears throat> I'm going to take uh, two more questions. We have a few more, but uh, I guess we're running a little bit out of, uh, you know, beyond our allotted time here. I'll be more than happy to uh, respond uh, to others offline. Uh, do you place any stop losses for the pair strategy? That Tucker. Oh, I'm sorry, you you, you dropped out. Uh, we have looked at uh, stop loss for the pair strategy. Uh, our initial result indicated that uh, it it didn't improve performance, but uh, we also have a. Um, we also have a, an exit date, so if uh, if we don't see the profit develop before the exit date, we exit anyways. So the in some sense the stop loss is um, implemented by the uh, uh, fixed exit date, which we tend to see is about uh, about 20 days. Okay, um, I think this is the last questions, and there are quite a few more. I'm going to. Uh, respond to you guys uh, who I have not, and I apologize for not being able to uh, capture all the questions here, but I'll respond to every single one of them individually um, after the webinar is completed. Um, do you also incorporate other sources of data for identifying correlation, uh, for example tweets, I guess social media buzz, or other type of uh, proprietary data sources? Um, I'll, I'll take uh, the first uh, uh, approach to answer, and then Tucker, you can probably complete uh, complete uh, with anything I'm, I'm missing here. Sure. Uh, so our data, we have uh, three sources of data. We have obviously um, technical data that's price volume based for the most part, and all the permutations of price volume information. We also have um, a complete set of fundamental data that is prim primarily on the, the behavior and the and the and the accomplishment from uh, earnings and uh, performance-based indicators of corporations. And the third source is uh, what we call third-party proprietary data. So we have a whole variety of data that we evaluate on ongoing basis, and we evaluate the quality and the, uh, and, and the predictive value of that, those data points. Uh, so we've assessed uh, social media uh, buzz or sentiment uh, as well as other types of uh, information, such as insider uh, buying and selling information, as well as uh, supply logistics uh, that corresponds to uh, supply chain, uh, how one supplier can affect the behavior of uh, its supply, ch its uh, vendors, or how many suppliers can affect this whole chain of uh, of uh, of suppliers uh, to a given vendor. So we evaluate these type of things on an ongoing basis and uh, incorporate them into our slew of indicators. We have about 300 or so indicators that describe an equity in any given time. Tucker, would you like to add anything? Sure, yeah. Um, so we're, 
aggressively adding uh, new sorts of data, uh, for instance, fundamental indicators, the Greenblatt indicator, which is based on fundamental data. Uh, we've got a, a, a great additional proprietary data feed uh, based on insider buying and selling. Uh, and we're also ramping up uh, another indicator based on a, a machine learning approach called uh, support vector machines or SVM uh, with one of our with one of our partners. So look for an announcement with regard to that. But yes, in general, we can add uh, any sort of uh, data feed as as long as it uh, you know as long as it relate as long as we can make the relation to a particular uh, stock and ETF symbols. Okay, uh, I think we've uh, exhausted the full hour um, that we have uh, allowed ourselves. Um, you can find us, by the way, on uh, Bloomberg. Uh, we have four of our applications available on Bloomberg on the app portal platform. Uh, you can see on the screen the, the keywords that you can use to access any of our applications on Bloomberg. And of course, uh, you can use us uh, through our web interface by going to lucenaresearch.com. Thank you so much for your time and your support. It's been a great year for us, and we are extremely excited to continue to support you for years to come. Tucker? Yes, uh, thank you very much. We sincerely appreciate your time. Uh, we'll make this uh, webinar available online, and we'll uh, also follow up with uh, folks individually on the questions we weren't able to answer.